Go ahead, sir. Uh, let me say, first of all, that um, I've been walking with the Lord for 25 years and uh, deep in the study of scripture as it relates to apologetics, thanks in large part to your ministry, which I must say is no small ministry. As far as I'm concerned, you are a towering figure in the church, sir. And, um, and it's out of the body, by the way, because that's the way I receive your spirit into my heart when I hear your voice you. through your ministry. Um, what I'd like to say is that uh, I've been drawn into the study of near-death experiences over the past few years, NDEs as they're commonly <clears throat> referred to, and uh, certain areas in the neurosciences and physics. I've come to a realization that um, in this experience, hands down seems to be the strongest argument against atheism. And without using scripture at all um, in the first act. And yet, in these experiences, the very nature of the environment and God they seem to reflect is best reflected or found in the gospel message. So if that rings of truth, um, and I've heard you comment indirectly on such experiences on multiple occasions um, in, in, in alluding to the power of God, my question is, how is it, and I, <laughs> My question is essentially, why do you think the church seems to shy away from this phenomenon when we who claim to know something profound about uh, spirituality and the soul should be all over this kind of research? As it, from my understanding, represents the first sort of strict scientifically approachable method that can potentially prove the existence of the soul separate from the body. <clears throat> Fascinating question. Thank you, and thank you for your kind words, too. But I think your question is very pointed here in terms of why is the church shied away from this kind of... Uh, you know, it's very interesting how experiences of this nature, surreal or supernatural, or even if you extend it into a broader spectrum of visions and dreams and things like that that some people seem to have, that have given them empirical affirmation. But what I think, to answer your question and keep it brief, that happens is not that I think most in the church would deny the reality of it. I think they struggle with the cultural relevance and the counter arguments that come when a presentation is made purely from an experiential or a non-verifiable direct uh, experience. I, last time I was here, I remember very clearly closing one of my messages with my, the experience of my father-in-law. You remember that story, yeah. And my wife was standing right by his side. It's very fascinating. We, we actually never tell many of, much of what happened. And if anybody had known my father-in-law, uh, including his doctor who knew him well, stunned at what all happened in the last 24 to 36 hours, a little more than that, I forget the exact sequence. But I remember while he was sitting in the room uh, in Toronto, my, my father-in-law was a chemical engineer. He was a hardcore fact guy. And he was not given to uh, any kind of esoteric arguments on anything. He wanted the flesh and bones of argument. And in one, uh, just, uh, I don't know exactly how long it was before he died, but he was sitting next to my wife, Margie. And he said to Margie, he said, what's going on in this room? Why are we seeing so many people out here? She said, Dad, there's nobody here, just Mom and me. He said, no, this room has a lot of people out here. He said, there's a busyness here, and there's, I see one person with a back, his back to me. And he said, Margie, that looks an awful lot like Jesus to me, but I can't see his face. And she tried to change that subject. He said, what is going on out here? I think it was before the night before, if I'm not mistaken, because he had not been talking for a long while and went to silence again before he died. And then the next day, again, pardon me, the sequence, she looked at him and she said, Dad, what was this you were talking about last night? Because she's a nurse herself and sometimes she thought hallucination can give you things and so on. He said about what happened last night. She said, yeah, there was a lot of activity going on in here and I think I saw the back of the Lord himself. And this conversation wasn't going to change from him. And then just before he died, of course, he'd gone into silence again and then looked up to the heavens and said, amazing, just amazing. And that looked to his wife of 63 some years, Jean, he said, Jean, I love you. And he was gone. It is amazing to me that there are experiences like this. 
My wife, I nearly lost her when she was 28 years old. She had an ectopic pregnancy, and I was driving her to uh, where we were staying, and she went unconscious. We didn't even know she was pregnant at that time. And um, actually, I think it um, may just shortly after I graduated from here. And uh, till this day, she and two or three of my teammates who've been through the same thing, when she, when I carried her, she was unconscious, and I laid her literally on the, with the help of somebody else, laid her on the floor of the Holiday Inn where we pulled up. And I was so out of it, not knowing what had happened, and the manager called the ambulance and so on. But she was gone. They couldn't find a pulse. They couldn't find a blood pressure. And when we took her to the hospital, she just landed, landed from a flight. And the doctor said, if this had happened 30 minutes before on the plane, you wouldn't have seen your wife alive. And uh, so we rushed her to the hospital. She'd lost 60% of her blood. She told me later, she said, she said, Rav, she said, I want you to know, I knew exactly what was going on around. She said, I was watching it all happening. And I just wanted you to know, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. God is going to rescue me. But I couldn't speak. But I knew exactly. I can tell you exactly what was going on. My colleague in Singapore, Joe Phillips, his wife, Sinu, had the same thing two years ago. And she was telling me the same thing. And when Margie heard it, she said, now would you believe it? You weren't believing it. I was telling you the same thing. These are mysterious things. Yeah. Over a thousand of these yeah. accounts, and I because think of real. that, they, they can the be care we, the, the care we need to have is that culturally, we want to make sure that we don't often take one experience as true as it is and build the whole theology around that, because then it opens the door to somebody else coming up with a counter experience, building a whole theology around that. So the reason that this is true is because the word of God is true. That the soul exists, that there's a spiritual reality. Yes. And so you argue from the written word of God, confirmed by experience, and not just the experience, and therefore the word of God is true. Because that then moves into different directions. So just take the propositional truth, keep it as the primary authority, sustained by experience. I'm sure one day we'll all stand before God and we will know those closing moments were not imagination, they were very real in the separation of the body from the soul. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ben. I'm a student here at TEDS. Um, my question is derived from your presentation and how you explain the image of God. You use an illustration for uh, the capacity for loving relationships in children, your, your grandchild. Um, so how would you answer someone who points to animals having the same or at least a similar capacity to love and have relationships? Would that capacity for loving and having relationships then be something essential to being in the image of God? It's a good question. You're asking uh, <clears throat> somebody who comes from a family who loves dogs. You know, uh, cats I'll leave for another day, but uh, dogs I'm a great lover of. And uh, I'll never forget, never forget, we had a border collie. Called him GK. He was named after GK Chesterton. And we'd had him for, a, brought, a, brought, a, brought him in England. GK was the nearest thing to a human that I'd ever seen. Unbelievable. Border Collies organize everything, you know. And uh, when he was on his last legs, literally, literally in his last legs, uh, I phoned my wife because she, he was really her dog. I said, honey, I think GK is going pretty fast. You better come home. She was at work. She got into the car and came. He was at the other end of our hall. He had collapsed. I couldn't get him to stand up anymore. And we were just going to take him to the vet. She came in from the garage door this way, and he was there, all of about a good 12, 14 feet away. As soon as he saw her, and she just bent down and looked in his direction, he got up. It was an amazing thing to see. I almost wished I could have filmed it. He got up, and Margie purposely waited to see and he struggled and struggled and struggled and literally came and collapsed at her feet. And that was the last, and we carried him out. Did he express his love and devotion to her? I believe that. The Bible says the ox knows its owner, and the donkey is its master's crib. So when you talk about moral reasoning of defining good and evil, making sober-minded judgments and the complexities of life, the animal world does not transcend to that level. It's a difference not just in degree, it's a difference in kind. Are there intimations of it? Yes, there are in all of creation, which, which groans 
And I've liked the metaphor that God uses for the millennial motif of the lion lying down with the lamb, that even there that redemption draweth nigh that transforms all of reality. But the difference in kind is essential for us to maintain that he died to forgive us for our sins. He would not see the animal as being in the category of a sinner in his eyes. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Yes, sir. When the Lord has decided that he is tired of being without your personal company and he wants to have you to himself, what one thing do you want as a man after his heart? What one thing do you want to be said of you in this life? See, okay. <clears throat> well, thanks very much. Uh, you know, when uh, I've been now an itinerant for 40 years, it's been tough. It's been really tough. Uh, the body takes a beating, the mind takes a beating. Sometimes the family takes a beating in the process, you know, but by God's grace, he's kept my children strong in him and it wasn't easy through a winding path. So I, whenever people like you express thanks, it means an awful lot to me, but it also means an awful lot to my family and my children to hear that and they appreciate it. I was just thinking as I was listening to you, the Lord brought to mind a young man. I sat across him. Uh, Matt will know who I'm talking about here. He's a very strikingly good looking young man. He was in Hollywood. If he were here, he would tell you his story. He was really serving as a prostitute, as a male prostitute to the Hollywood elite. He was a porn star, handsome looking guy, well built and all of that. And he said, I would come home at night and I would say to myself, what am I doing? What am I doing? He said, people thought I was getting away with it. He said, I really wasn't. And he told me his story. But then he found Christ. Today he's married to a beautiful gal in Australia who is a pediatrician working in that city. And his whole life now is given to trying to rescue people from that very pit from which he came, the horrors. He said, I didn't know one happy person in there. I knew a lot of people chasing money and people chasing fame, but I didn't know one happy person in there. So when transformation comes, it's a marvelous thing. And so celebrate it and always be grateful to God for that. In terms of what I would like to hear from God, nothing more than what he himself has said is the divine accolade. Well done. Anything more than that will be pure gravy. I think, uh, yeah. <clears throat> I just, thank you. thank you. Dr. Zacharias, I am so blessed to have um, benefited from your ministry. And you've done a wonderful job talking about what it means to be a human. I would like to know, uh, I too have been a Christian for 40 years. I'd like to hear your thoughts on when does the human begin? We, we understand that in the gestation period, there's no decisive moment it seems, from conception to birth, through development, until brain death. How would you answer the question when somebody asks, <coughs> because our president's been asked this question, and he claimed it was above his pay rate to be able to answer. The Supreme Court, 40 years ago, <coughs> was asked this question, and they claimed they didn't know. But when does the human begin? <clears throat> I just wonder whether the mistake is being made in a different way within the womb, where we are defining when we know they are not a human being. We just assume, my daughter is expecting her second child. She's only just a few weeks pregnant. But right from the instant that she sensed she was, she came to our home and in a beautiful way just broke the news to us. And when you look at the picture of that baby. Again, I carry it in my Blackberry. It's the size of a lima bean, that stage. And you say, with 150 fetal heartbeat, just a tiny little thing like that. How dare I say that three minutes before it was not a human being? For a person who chooses to eliminate that life, they are playing God. And I just say, at the moment of conception, when that has taken place, I don't play God. 
I let the sovereign God be God over that entity. By me attempting to eradicate it then is by me saying at that point, I'm defining them existentially rather than essentially. So we have to define them essentially and not existentially. To me, when a person has, when that, at that, at that moment, there are three DNAs in the mother's body. The father's DNA has entered, the mother's DNA is in, there's a third DNA already in the making of another life. You take a simple thing like this. At what point do you learn to have a smooth backhand? in tennis. It's foolish to try and break that down. You know every sequence and every moment comes into play at the moment at which it has its entire fluidity. And to take away one step and said before this it was not a smooth backhand after this. No, everything is learned in the process of the very swing of the arm. In human life, we had daren't play games as if we can say we break this down now to three seconds before you were not a human being. If we do, then the only logic is for me to tell the world now that I'm basically a 66-year-old fetus. <laughs> I'm not. I've always been a human being from the moment of conception to where I am. We must define by who they are, not what they can do. The moment you start defining by what they can do, you enter the slippery slope of all kinds of extermination. You know, it is interesting that there are people sitting in Congress today and in leadership today who are one of the very few who were for late-term abortions. From both sides of the aisle, there were so many who said, absolutely not, you cannot go, go to this late-term abortion. But there are people in power today who were for it. Yes. Scary. Yeah. For them was the question, when does this person become a human? No. Uh, I, I'll, I'll give you a quick illustration of this and move to the move here. I remember at Ohio State University, I was with uh, um, Hugh Ross, and we were on the air. And uh, we were talking about, uh, Hugh Ross was asked a question on the age of the Earth. And he was answering, he's an astrophysicist, he's answering the question. And a woman phones in and says, get these fellows off the air, get these men off the air, we know what it's all about, it all got to do with the abortion issue anyway. We're talking about the age of the Earth. <laughs> you know? And uh, so she just went on, and uh, so he, she said, that's what it's all about, isn't it? And so Hugh Ross just looked at me like that, I said, ma'am, this is a scientist talking about the age. He said, ah, I know that's what you're all, these are all uh, smoke screens. You're all, I said, all right, since you brought that up, can we talk? She said, what do you want to know? I said, I have a question for you. Why do you believe it is your right to abort a baby? She said, it is my moral right to do that. You have no business stopping me. I said, all right, let's accept that. I said, then I have a question for you. I said, when a plane crashes and 10 people live and 90 people die or whatever, you get angry with God, that God did an immoral act by selecting some to live and some to die. But when you get a chance for one person to live or one person to die, you call it your moral right to take that life. Can you explain this conundrum for me? The phone was hung up and that was the end of the conversation. See, moral rights are not just self-word. Moral rights have a moral responsibility and the moral responsibility is treat an entity essentially not existentially. You start defining existentially, it's a slippery slope. Yes. Yep. Hi, Ravi. Um, my name is Chantal Smith, and I am currently a Master's of Divinity student at Andrews Theological Seminary in Michigan. Um, and this is the second year at the university that we're putting on our Social Justice Summit. And I, the Social Justice Summit this year is on human sex trafficking. Um, having worked in India in the brothels in the red light district um, with women who have been abused and molested and have um, participated in prostitution, um, after watching the documentary Nefarious and hearing the various testimonials mm -hmm. of women who have been sex trafficked and abused and even women who have just been um, abused in general just by family members or whatever circumstances may have accompanied that experience, how do we go about practically teaching what it means to be human again for people who have suffered or experienced um, great, de great degrees of emotional, spiritual and sexual damage? I appreciate that. So you have done work in Mumbai and all of that, have you? Calcutta. Calcutta. Yes. Well, that's equally a messy spot. My wife's going to be there tomorrow in Calcutta. And my daughter, Naomi, who directs our Wellspring International Program, is involved in this very work of rescuing women from the sex trafficking industry, women and children at risk. So in Mumbai, the street that you see in uh, Slumdog Millionaire, the 
sex trafficking that goes on there. My colleague Matt actually was talking about going back there and helping the kids that have been rescued because Matt's an artist, wants to teach them how to paint and so on. These are kids born out of prostitution backgrounds. They all have AIDS and they're in a home where we have helped raise some support for them and build some buildings for them and so on. Uh, the sad thing to me is this thing has become so deeply entrenched in some countries that politicians can't do anything about it. Now it's involved in the thuggery and the underworld and your life is at risk if you try to talk against it. Uh, one, I don't know whether it will ever be eradicated, but I remember being with Mother Teresa on two occasions mm -hmm. in her home, Nirmal Hriday, tender heart, and watching the people picked up off the streets, the destitute, and one was being cradled in the arm with a dropper was being fed. And Mother Teresa's whole philosophy was, even if I cannot make a comprehensive difference in the world, I can make a difference in enough number of lives so that if they themselves get the message and change exponentially, they can bring about a change in the world. That was the way she operated, that she couldn't do it all. But if she touched enough lives, they in turn would go and touch others and make a difference. In fact, this year, just a few weeks ago, I was in Mumbai to speak at the Mother Teresa Award and had an opportunity of speaking about her love for the poor and the needy and so on. We also had some interesting theological discussions and so forth. I commend you for it. I ask you to keep doing it. I ask you not to get discouraged about it. And I tell my own daughter to come back and take a break from it because my daughter burned out. She's just a wee little thing. And she, you know, in her 20s, she was in the thick of it. She was working in the White House. When we called her and gave her this position, straight out of Wheaton, she went to Harabakoa in Santo Domingo and was working with orphans. She's had a passion for kids all her life. Keep doing it. Keep doing it because just like the Lord touched individual lives who in turn changed their cities and changed history, uh, my suggestion to you is it's a long, steep road. No one person may ever be able to lie back like William Wilberforce and say, thank God the law is passed, it is over with. Mm -hmm. But if you make enough changes in lives, it will make a difference. The difficulty of the rehab and re-entry is right. the hard thing that you're talking about. Yes. It has to be done, though. I've, we've got a young gal in, in Cape Town who Naomi helped purchase a restaurant when she came out of prostitution. And she ran that restaurant and because she wanted to become a chef. We funded her to go and take a chef's training. She came to one of our weekends, Founders Weekend, with a little 12-year-old boy. And she stood up there and she said, in her accent, she said, do you know what it means to say I'm a chef? Mm. rather than I'm a prostitute. Mm. I'm now a chef. I'm now a chef. And the tears running down and her little boy just looking up. Watching Let My People Think with Dr. Ravi Zacharias. We're grateful for your prayers and financial support. If you'd like to know more about this ministry or would like to donate to our efforts, you can call us at 1-800-448-6766 or visit us online at www.rzim.org. You can also stay connected to RZIM through Twitter and Facebook. Our mailing address is RZIM, Post Office Box 921-939, Norcross, Georgia, 30010. Can Man Live Without God is a brilliant defense of the Christian faith. In it, Ravi Zacharias shows how affirming the reality of God's existence matters in our everyday lives. How you answer the questions of God's existence will impact your relationship with others, your commitment to integrity, your attitude toward morality, and your perception of truth. To purchase your copy of Can Man Live Without God, call 1-800-705-7729. Hello friends, this is Ravi Zacharias. In the background is the majestic Mount Ararat. Here we are truly, uh, seriously, in a very, very historic setting. Genesis 8 tells us about Noah's Ark resting on Mount Ararat. Four or five other passages in Scripture say the same thing. Today. Geographically, it sits on the slope towards Turkey. Next to me on my left is a small building beneath which is a dungeon where Gregory the Illuminator was held for 13 to 14 years. But during that time of his imprisonment, 
in a time of prayer with the leading ruler and his wife's sickness and so on. The fact is that a story is told of her healing and this then becomes actually the first Christian nation. It would predate the Constantinian uh, edict for Rome itself. I'm here in Armenia mainly to commemorate the uh, 100th anniversary of the genocide which took place in 1915 when over a million Armenians were slaughtered. It's a tragic story and uh, very few people actually get into this subject. Even Hitler referred to it as one of the great atrocities that had preceded and how it had been forgotten. On my lapel is a pin, it's a forget-me-not, 1.5 million pins of those were designed to remind the people of all that had happened over 100 years ago. Yesterday we had the privilege of going to the museum and seeing uh, the memories of it, pictures of it, stories of it. Uh, an incredibly tragic blotch upon history. Uh, even the Pope referred to this, how important it is that we remember this tragedy and not repeat it. But the evil in the heart of man never seems to uh, learn from history and continues to repeat its mistakes. And I myself believe we are seeing the progenitors of the same kind of thing happening in our time. And world leaders are silent on the markings and the predispositions of destructions that are taking place. But here I am with 12 churches coming together in, uh, in gathering and night after night for three nights of meetings, hundreds of people come. The music is representative of different uh, traditions here. Uh, it is my time and privilege to be here for the second occasion. I came here five years ago. The beauty of the gospel is still the only hope for mankind. As Conrad Adenauer said after the Holocaust and all that Germany was involved in, he said, outside of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I know of no other hope for mankind. So the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel story is still what is needed in our globe. So RZIM is involved in all of this, and uh, my hope is that we will be heard on many a setting. Invitations continue to pour in from this part of the world and we stand as Christian apologists to remember the past, to capture the moment, seize the day, and to build for the future with the hope of Jesus Christ in the hearts of men and women. This is quite a setting in which to do it. God bless you. Thank you for all you do for us in this ministry and for all your support. Without that, we would not be able My People Think is a listener-supported television ministry and is furnished by Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, Atlanta, Georgia.